Hi, this time let me provide you with more sample questions related to the concept of BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy. So this is your mentor, Ray, your fact check buddy. First, let's greet our passer. Congratulations to Mark Eugene de Peralta of the University of Northern Philippines, my fellow Ilocano, northern part of the country, who passed the NCLEX RM for the State Board of the Northern Mariana Islands Board of Nursing. That's July 10, 2021. Congratulations, Mark Eugene de Peralta. We are so proud of you. Okay, for those of you who want to be like them, join me in my 45 days power pack exclusive NCLEX RM test preparations class, which will start on September 11. To know more details, send us an email. So join us in this mission. Our goal is to provide free NCLEX RN application review to 100 nurses. And to help us achieve this, just watch and finish the ads in our videos. Thank you. So here are more questions related to the concept of BPA. Now, our first focus for our quick fix would be your benign prostatic hypertrophy. Pay particular attention to the fact that your BPH is common among patients who are above 50 years old. So patients with um, increasing age are more at risk for BPH, of course, okay? The exact cause is unknown, but take note of this fact that the incidence of benign prostatic hypertrophy increases with age. In fact, 90% of those who are above eight years old would have it. And take note also of the fact that those who had orchiectomy usually do not develop your benign prostatic hypertrophy. Now, if you talk about the common signs and symptoms, we're going to compare BPH later on with prostatitis so that when you are given the opportunity to answer questions related to that, it's not going to be difficult for you. So remember that in benign prostatic hypertrophy, because of the enlargement of the prostate, which could be compressing okay, the urethra where urine would pass out, then there's going to be frequency of urination, urgency of urination, decreased size and force of urinary stream, and increased urination at night. Now, one of the important things that you have to remember would be, is hematuria a sign of BPH? If it is a sign, yes. But when does it occur? It usually occurs late in the disease. So if the question is asking about early signs, then you don't put a check on hematuria. But if the question is asking about late signs, then you may want to put a check on hematuria. Now, one of the common drugs that is usually given for clients with BPH would be your finasteride, okay? Your finasteride is your alpha reductase inhibitor, and it acts in three ways. First, it increases testosterone. Second, it decreases the prostate gland. And third, it increases hair growth. Therefore, Okay, your finasteride could be used to treat hair loss. However, there's also, there are also studies that say that the use of finasteride can potentially cause breast cancer in males. So that when your patient is taking finasteride, instruct them to report breast lumps or the presence of breast discharge or the presence of any pain and tenderness. So what is important that you have to pay particular attention to at this point would be knowing specific functional concepts related to your BPH. So let's begin by trying to answer a simple question. In a client with benign prostatic hypertrophy, which of the following substances may worsen the symptoms? So we, we talked about the symptoms early on. Diuretics, yes, that may potentially worsen, specifically nocturia. Tricyclic antidepressants may cause anticholinergic side effects, which leads to urinary retention, so it could worsen. Okay, the difficulty of the patient to urinate. Antihistamine may also cause urinary retention. So yes, coffee, yes, may worsen nocturia at night. Okay, finasteride would usually help diminish your signs and symptoms. So it is an X, okay? So for your patients with benign prostatic hypertrophy, um, pseudoephedrine should not be given and the drugs that may usually have your anticholinergic side effects because this could cause urinary retention. Like, for example, atrophin could also cause urinary retention. Okay. 
Next, let's try to compare your prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate, and benign prostatic hypertrophy, which is enlargement of the prostate. Let's take a look at the risk factors that are common to both. Now, this is what is funny. Both could be associated with urinary tract infection, and prostatitis is a risk factor for BPH, and BPH is a risk factor for prostatitis. <laughs> okay. So that leads us to think that if a patient has prostatitis, they could be at risk for BPH, and if a patient has BPH, they could be at risk for prostatitis. Okay. Now, rectal intercourse is a risk factor for prostatitis, including dehydration and pelvic trauma. On the other hand, okay, the, risk fact, the other risk factors for your BPH would be urethral stricture, presence of kidney stones, cancer of the prostate or the bladder, as well as aging, family history, the presence of diabetes mellitus, and obesity. Look, as if I'm trying to move towards that, but I just hope I won't have it. Okay, so the most important thing, therefore, that you have to remember here is what risk factor could be common to both, and that's going to be your urinary tract infection. Okay, now which one is usually associated with family history? That's going to be your benign prostatic hypertrophy. Which one is expected with advancing age? Benign prostatic hypertrophy. Which one is associated with diabetes mellitus and obesity? It's going to be benign prostatic hypertrophy. Okay. So remember this functional concept, high fever occurs in acute bacterial prostatitis and not in benign prostatic hypertrophy. So if you are to be asked, which symptom would differentiate acute bacterial prostatitis from benign prostatic hypertrophy, it should be high fever. Therefore, you need to monitor the patient's temperature, okay, to check whether the patient is having prostatitis or benign prostatic hypertrophy. So if the patient presents with, say, for example, urgency, hesitancy, and nocturia, and then it comes with fever, then suspect prostatitis. Without the fever, then suspect your benign prostatic hypertrophy. Now take note, weak urine stream occurs in both prostatitis and BPH. So if you are asked, which risk factors occurs in both BPH and prostatitis, that's going to be urinary tract infection. Which Symptom occurs in both, that's going to be weak urinary stream or decreased size and force of urinary stream. Which symptom differentiates acute prostatitis from benign prostatic hypertrophy? That's going to be high fever. Okay, so let's try answering a question. Prostatitis can be diagnosed by which of the following tests? Urinalysis, ultrasound, cystoscopy, prostate biopsy? Yes. Digital rectal exam and prostate massage? Yes, that's also done in the... Um, assessment for benign prostatic hypertrophy, complete blood count that is done to check whether there is an infection. Remember, prostatitis is caused by a bacteria. And then prostate-specific antigen tests and CT scan, that's actually to rule out the presence of benign prostatic hypertrophy. Yes, biophysical profile is not a test for prostatitis. Your biophysical profile is a test in the newborn baby if you want to determine okay, the fetal breathing, fetal movement a reaction to an unstress test, amniotic fluid volume, and your um, overall um, physical uh, um, um, health of the baby. So in essence, the most important criterion in biophysical profile would be your fetal breathing movement. Okay, so fetal breathing movement, okay, fetal heart rate, fetal movement, fetal breathing, fetal movement, fetal heart rate, and reaction, sorry, reaction to non-stress test, and then your amniotic fluid volume, okay? So it's done to assess the infant at birth, okay? So if you want to find out the fetal well-being, okay, immediately after delivery, then that's the test that's done. That's your biophysical profile, okay? So remember, prostatitis can lead to infertility, sepsis, and even death. Now, let's resolve this issue. Previously, let me just update you about Sao Palmetto. Previously, it has been recommended that Sao Palmetto, which is an herbal remedy, the picture is here, could actually help diminish the symptoms of benign prostatic hypertrophy because your Sao Palmetto is believed to cause atrophy of the prostate. That was before However, at this point in time, Sao Palmetto, um, the effects in terms of the atrophy of the prostate, okay, in the studies that were done, there are contrasting results. 
So can we categorically say, therefore, that Sao Palmetto is 100% effective for the treatment of BPH? No, we can't. But we can tell our patient, we can cite that there are studies that identified um, the effect of Sao Palmetto in terms of promoting atrophy of the prostate, but there are also studies that yielded contrary results, okay? So therefore, okay, it's very important that we inform our clients about this development, okay? So Sao Palmetto eases urinary difficulty in clients with BPH by preventing its progression. Other uses includes, aside from BPH, would be your asthma. It's used also as diuretic. It's used in cough as astringent and in clients with bronchitis. So let's try answering a sample question and use what we just have learned. A client with benign prostatic hypertrophy, okay, ask the nurse if taking Sao Palmetto will help improve the symptoms. The knowledgeable nurse will give which of the following responses. Let's analyze each of these. The way to answer this question is not to rush. I advise you to take it slow, okay, Comprehend each option, even if you already have in mind a potentially correct answer, do not let that drive you into rushing to choose a specific question. So let's analyze. One, you will need to take it for a couple of weeks to know if it improves your symptoms. Um, treatment with Sao Palmetto would usually take four to six weeks, okay? So however, does it address Okay, the question of the client related to the management of the symptoms, I don't think so too. There have been studies that say it is effective and some studies say it's not. You can discuss this with your healthcare provider. We can consider that, it's open-ended. Three, I understand your concern. The pharmacy can best explain it to you. That's passing the bat. And four, herbal remedies in general have no therapeutic effect, so it is best to avoid it. I think that reflects a personal bias. And so the best answer therefore is number two. There have been studies that say it is effective and some studies say it's not. You can discuss this with your healthcare. Let's try answering sample questions. Here we go. The nurse is about to insert a catheter to a client with benign prostatic hypertrophy. What is the primary reason for lubricating the catheter? Is it one, to prevent infection? Two, to decrease spasm of the bladder orifice? Three, to reduce friction along the urethra? Four, to prevent formation of encrustation at the bladder sphincter? The best answer would be definitely to reduce friction along the urethra, okay? In order that the patient will not have too much discomfort. Next, which of the following manifestations occur in benign prostatic hypertrophy? Let's begin. Difficulty starting the flow of urine? Yes. Um, this usually occurs because the enlarged prostate would press on the urethra, okay, causing now, resulting into difficulty starting the flow of urine. Frequent nighttime voiding or nocturia. This is expected in patients with benign prostatic hypertrophy. Yes. Voiding at more frequent intervals, we call this frequency. Yes, because they are unable to completely empty the bladder. That's why they void very, very frequently. Greater force of urinary stream? No. They have decreased force okay, of urinary stream because of the obstruction in the urethra. And then decreased frequency of urination? They have increased frequency of urination, not decreased. Okay. Now, next, here's another question. Which of the following statements about finasteride are true? Select all that apply. Crushed tablets should not be handheld by pregnant women. Yes, because to be absorbed in the skin and may cause birth defects in pregnant women or women who are about to become pregnant. Okay, so we put a check on that. It is used for treatment of hair loss. Yes, okay. It can cause erectile dysfunction in males. Yes, studies have shown that it could potentially cause that. It should not be taken with sildenafil. No, the one that should not be taken with sildenafil is your Viagra because uh, is your nitroglycerin, rather sildenafil is your Viagra because combining sildenafil with nitroglycerin could cause a uh, fatal hypotension. Then breast lumps in male normally develops. No, the breast lumps may potentially indicate breast cancer in males. Okay, so once again, this is your mentor, Ray, and your fact check buddy inviting you if you want to join me in my 45 days power pack exclusive NCLEX RN test preparations. 
that starts on September 11, send us an email and we'll be glad to address your inquiry. So let's learn together. If you have any requests, you may want me to um, focus on my future videos, send in your request to my email mentor at raygapos at gmail.com. So this is your mentor is saying a functional concept a day keeps your NPLEX RN peers away. If you love this video, please don't forget to subscribe, share, and hit the like and bell notification.